Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a look at the last four pieces of nonfiction that I picked up. First up, I picked up Layla Parsons' The Commander, Fauzi El Kwukji and the Fight for Arab Independence, 1914 to 1948. And this takes the 1948 Arab Israeli War and puts it in the context of the broader anti colonial post Ottoman struggle as opposed to just framing it as an issue uh, with the British Mandate in Palestine or with the creation of Israel, which I think gives a broader context that a lot of histories of that particular conflict just don't get into. Fauzi al Kouakchi was a really interesting person in that he was very anti-British colonialism and anti-French colonialism. At one point he was in the colonial French military and started a mutiny there. But interestingly, prior to that, he had been in the Ottoman forces and was actually loyal at that point, even though at some points he commented that uh, he felt that as an Arab he was being passed over for promotions that a Turk would have gotten and etc. But he did stay loyal through that even when there were revolts happening during the First World War, which is interesting. And then later on he was actually very pro-German imperialism, which again is interesting. His second wife was German and he did live in Germany in the 1930s. There's a little complexity to that that is not as simple as simply being anti-imperialistic. There were very specific cases and, and anyway, so it was quite fascinating because it was, I think, it is easy to present an anti-colonial struggle as anti-imperialism full scale as opposed to having somebody who was involved in so many points of these conflicts from the First World War through to the Arab-Israeli War and presents the complexities of his personal beliefs in a, and allows them to be what they are essentially as opposed to falling in line with a particular political viewpoint. So I did think this was very interesting. I did feel like I need to read more around some of the additional people who were mentioned. There is a very nice reference section uh, that I appreciated flipping through. This author is a professor at McGill. That was very interesting stuff. It is a little on the dry side, so I think if you are not particularly interested in that period of history, I don't know that I would recommend it as any kind of uh, general work, but if you are interested I do highly recommend that because it does present a very different context than I think a lot of work that looks at that. Uh, I think there's a tendency to separate out the Ottoman period from the British and French colonial period as opposed to presenting it as this continuum and I think it's really useful context to present that as a continuum. Switching to a completely different style of <laughs> writing, uh, next up I read Mira Jacobs' Good Talk. This I saw on a number of people's best of the year lists at the end of last year. This is a graphic memoir that is a memoir completely in conversations. Uh, it's really stylistically interesting. It takes photographs and then has the text and the speech bubbles on top of that and the people are essentially almost paper dolls with very limited facial expressions and everything we get are conversations. It opens with a conversation that the author is having with her son, essentially about Michael Jackson but actually reflecting on the, the kind of nuances of racial identity in the United States. The author and her husband both grew up in New Mexico where she was one of very few South Asian students and her husband who is white but Jewish was one of very few non-Christian students because her family is uh, one of those South Indian Christian families. And so it starts out with her working out this identity question with her son who's trying to figure out what labels apply and when. And then she reflects back through her childhood in New Mexico, her life in New York City. She was in New York on 9-11 and what happened after that and how that changed. The way interactions work in a particular... If, if one is racialized in a very particular way. And then we go forward in time and she, her, her parents-in-law turn out to be Trump supporters and how those conversations go, which is fascinating. Some of the conversations with her husband then are fascinating because his making the peace type conversations are frustrating to read but at the same time you can almost appreciate uh, why he's trying to do that. Anyway, this was just brilliant. I thought the the style of the photos with the, the paper doll style art and then just the fact that it is almost a hundred percent conversations. There are a few sections of exposition but probably at least 90 percent of this is just conversation and it's just spectacular. Uh, it's a nice big fat book and this is great. I had this from the library and I think I might buy a copy of it because it was just fantastic. And if you are a fan of graphic memoirs and want to see something that's done in a very different style, I think there's a kind of a stereotype that every graphic memoir has this slightly rough uh, kind of pencil drawing style and that is a very distinct style and just fantastic conceptually and 
as it were. Next up, I read something that is a little lighter than a lot of the nonfiction that I normally pick up, and that is Fatima Bhutto's uh, New Kings of the World. This is a pop culture investigation, which is theoretically taking a look at the globalization in the appeal of Korean pop music, Bollywood movies, and Turkish soap operas. In reality, this is very heavily weighted to the Bollywood part, and within that it is very heavily weighted to evaluating the culture of Bollywood movies in the context of the political issues that happen between India and Pakistan, which is certainly a valid way to look at it, but, but considering that this is marketed as being a more global look at these things and as being, you know, about three things in equal parts, which it definitely is not, uh, I did think this was not sold correctly because 70% of this is about the Bollywood stuff. It's maybe about a quarter of it deals with Turkish soap operas in a very kind of superficial way. She at one point says she's watched, you know, 134 hours worth of these, and that's actually not very much because a lot of these shows have like 40 or 50 hour seasons per season. So you could watch one show <laughs> for, you know, a couple of years and that would be the whole thing. So saying 134 hours, I wasn't that, <laughs> that impressed. And there's only a single chapter involving the Korean pop music, which I thought, given how, I would say, of the three, in the kind of Anglosphere that is probably the, the one of these three things that does have the broadest appeal. Now, she is not specifically talking about the Anglosphere. Uh, one of the places that she looks at specifically is uh, Lima in Peru. But even when she discusses that, she approaches the idea of Bollywood movies have become popular in Peru because people can relate to them more so than to Hollywood movies, even though most of her discussion of that is about the musical element. And I think even 30 years ago in North America, people who are musical fans or fan would be drawn to Bollywood just because there are so many more musicals there than there are in the American made ones. So I thought it was slightly odd that she was taking that specific cultural angle as opposed to investigating the music angle because even when she's watching people dancing on the street and saying look at these people doing their Bollywood routines in Lima it's like yes because of the music in any case there are a lot of humorous footnotes in this that I thought were hilarious so I think it's definitely worth it for that just go into this being aware that it is it that it is a lot more narrow in scope than it promises and that while she digs fairly deep into the Bollywood stuff it is from a very specific cultural perspective uh, the, the bit about the Turkish soap operas was fun, but it's not particularly deep, but it's like women around the world think that Kibach Tatlu is sexy, and yes, I mean, he is, but that, that's not a deep reflection, you know, I wanted to see more than that. And as I said, the K-pop chapter is one chapter, so yeah, it wasn't what I expected it to be, but the footnotes in this are hilarious. But yeah, I think there's another book to be written on a similar topic from a slightly different angle that might be more interesting, but uh, yeah. I will say it's kind of fun to see someone who's known for her very serious political writing and for her very serious novels writing kind of pop culture fluff, so that's a little fun in and of itself. Finally, I read another graphic memoir, and that was Cena Grace's Self-Obsessed. I mentioned reading his Nothing Lasts Forever, which is his more recent graphic memoir a couple of weeks ago. That memoir followed him basically over the course of two years. This one is basically a collection of autobiographical writing that he did over the course of more than 10 years. And it starts when he was a teenager and goes into his career as a professional comics artist and writer. And because it covers such a broad time frame and it's work that he created over such a broad span of time, the quality is very uneven, as it would be. So if you are a huge fan of his work, it's interesting from the perspective of seeing his work evolve. But as a general memoir, it did make it very choppy. I do think in terms of what is the better memoir, Nothing Lasts Forever is a better read in terms of as an individual product on its own. I did think this was generally kind of fun, just because I'm familiar with a lot of his other work. I think if you're not particularly familiar with his work, I don't think this is necessarily where you would start with uh, familiarizing your, yourself with him. Yeah, but looking at how his art style and kind of process essentially has evolved was interesting, but as a book itself, yeah, yeah, 
was fine. I will, as always, insert some photos here. I will say one thing that I liked that only came up once or twice is that when he's replicating conversations with his mother and she's speaking Farsi, he writes uh, both a romanization and a translation at the bottom, and I think a lot of writers will either do one or the other, and I appreciate it that he did both. But anyway, that's like two panels in this entire book. So is that the right term? Romanization? Do you say Latinization? Transliteration? I'm not sure what the right word for that is. Anyway, you know what I mean. In any case, that was the nonfiction that I've read lately. It is a little lighter than usual. So hey, that's something. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you think. Anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.